In 2011, Rockstar Games took a break from creating fine-tuned experiences where we play as psychotic criminals, misunderstood teenagers with anger issues, and very angry cowboys to create a unique experience where this time we play as by-the-book cop with a mysterious past as he solves crimes in sunny Los Angeles. Ellie Noir was a different approach to storytelling from Rockstar. We weren't criminals even though we were used to that. We were cops, except for the other series by Rockstar where we play as a cop, but we haven't covered that yet so it's not canon. I played this game when it was released, being 16 at the time, and I loved it. It was easily one of my most replayed favorites for years after my initial playthrough. But as time went on and my mind moved on to things like the MCU, Five Nights at Freddy's, that tiny squeaky sound you get when you rub two pickles together, LA Noir got left behind. I revisited it a few years later when it was released in VR, but I was ferociously high for that entire chapter of my life, and I didn't really play the game. I fucking handle this bitch. Oh, no, oh fuck! So what better way to replay the game than to look at it analytically, critically, and as a more mature and seasoned gamer of the times? After all, Ellie Noir is a game with a deep story filled with twists and turns. A game that requires such a fine attention to detail that maybe being 16 or being Cheech and Chong the entire time I played it wasn't the best way to experience it. So without a further ado, enjoy my hopefully not terrible review of Ellie Noir. Ellie Noir is set in 1947 Los Angeles. You play as Detective Cole Phelps who starts off as a street cop after coming home from fighting in World War II. After solving a murder case, he's promoted to detective by an impressed captain. Now a part of the traffic department, Cole and his new partner Stefan Bukowski deal with hit and run cases, car burglaries, or murders where a vehicle was the weapon. There's this case where a man is missing and presumed dead and they find his car and yeah, he's probably dead, right? Only to find out he faked his death to get away from his wife and run away with a different woman, but now he's getting arrested for conspiracy and fraud and eventually you'll find out that the side chick left him after he got arrested and the main wife took him back. Or this other case where these two were trying to be together but they had to get rid of her husband first and claim his insurance so they stab him and throw him into oncoming traffic and when they get caught... Times were simpler back then. The last case in the traffic department gets pretty heavy thematically as you investigate a car that fell off this cliff, but the two girls inside survived. One of them is an older seasoned actress who tells Cole that somebody knocked them out, put them in the car, and tied a heavy object to the gas pedal to try and kill them. The passenger of the car was a 14 year old girl who ran away from home to become an actress and was forced to film herself uh, performing with older men before they tried to kill her too. The older actress sends her husband who just happens to be in a gang after the man who was responsible for it all. and. Cole Phillips races against time to get to the man before the gang does. He's successful but not after destroying an entire movie set and being promoted. After all that, we're introduced to Roy Earl, and he introduces Cole to Elsa who is crying over the recent death of her best friend. This will be important later so y'all better be taking notes. Write that down, write that down! <laughs> These missions all play more like a tutorial, guiding you along, teaching you the game's different mechanics, while always kind of pointing you in the right direction. Six months go by and Cole Phelps is now in the homicide department with his new partner, Rusty Galloway. Cole and Rusty investigate a series of murders, the first being a woman who was left naked and beaten with cryptic writing across her body. This becomes famous around Los Angeles as the Black Dahlia murder. Uh, this disturbing trend continues and another naked woman is found, also beaten and left with a message, and then yet another, and then once again another. While Cole and Rusty are usually able to find enough evidence to pin the crime on an angry and tired husband or a crazy homeless man with a history of violence, Cole isn't happy with the results. He insists that they are arresting the wrong people and that there's a secret mastermind behind all the murders, but nobody believes him and they tell him the murders are just copycat killers. All of this reaches its climax when Cole and the rest of the homicide department get a bunch of letters and poems from the actual Black Dahlia murderer, mocking them for not catching him yet. Cole and Rusty are sent on a wild goose chase around LA, solving the killer's riddles and finding items that were owned by the murder victims before finding an abandoned church where the Black Dahlia murderer was hiding. After a pretty intense chase through these underground tunnels, Cole Phelps kills the Black Dahlia murderer. The captain shows up and tells Cole and Rusty that what happened in the church stays between the three of them. That the Black Dahlia murderer is the half brother of a highly elected pol 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 politician, and the news of his identity can't ever get out. The men who were wrongly accused are released, and Cole is promoted as long as he keeps his mouth shut. Now. Before we move on, we gotta go We gotta go back a bit. You see, while Cole is out doing this detective work, the game has two side stories going on in the background, laying out some much needed exposition. One of these side plots is a series of flashbacks from Cole's time in the army. From the start of the game, Cole comes back to Los Angeles and everyone calls him a war hero. We don't know exactly what happened to him to justify being called a war hero and being given an honorary medal, but characters throughout the story give small hints. Oh, aren't you Cole Phelps, the war hero who was the only survivor on Sugar Hill? The whole time we're like, oh, Cole Phelps must have been a badass in the war. 
These flashbacks show his first arrival to his time with his regiment, while other characters such as Jack Kelso, Ira Hogboom, Felix Alvaro, and Courtney Sheldon, among others. Write those names down, y'all. We get a lot of information thrown at us during these flashbacks, but the most important things are, Cole quickly got promoted in his own unit, but he did not get along with anyone on his squad. Eventually, Cole sends Ira Hogboom into a cave with a flamethrower to burn the soldiers inside, thinking that there's an ambush waiting for them, but it's not soldiers. It's innocent families, men, women, and children who are not fighting in the war and are now burning alive. This messes up Ira mentally and Cole orders his squad to shoot everyone in the cave to put them out of their misery. Courtney Sheldon then shoots Cole in the back and while they debate leaving him to die in the cave, Jack Kelso orders the rest of the squad to save Cole and take him to the medics where he's patched up and sent home. And that's after the Sugar Hill battle, which the only reason he's known as a hero, a war hero, and he was like, wow, you're the only one who survived Sugar Hill? You're a badass. No, he kind of just laid there and waited for it to end while his team died around him so after he gets sent home after getting shot it's where we first start playing as him in the beginning of the game and that's one of the side plots unraveling throughout the game while playing the game you'll find these newspaper collectibles in certain rooms during certain investigations there are 13 newspapers and each time you pick them up you get a cutscene showing a story that seems unrelated to the main plot but as you get further along you realize these cutscenes provide some really important context later on Courtney Sheldon, or, or Sheldon as everyone calls him, now back from the war, talks to a Dr. Fontaine, a psychiatrist, about learning more about the mind. Because Sheldon has a friend who came back from the war super messed up and thinks Dr. Fontaine can fix him with his psychiatry. It's revealed that this friend is Ira Hoboom, who became traumatized from everything he saw in the war, including killing the innocent people in the gate, in the gate, in the cave. Dr. Fontaine keeps Ira sedated, much to Sheldon's frustration. While all this is happening, Cole, who was promoted to vice, is now working alongside Roy Earl. They find themselves investigating an illegal morphine distribution ring and at night he begins to have an affair with Elsa. Roy Earl catches Cole in the act and decides to snitch him out before Cole finds out where the morphine is coming from because of course Roy Earl is a crooked cop. Meanwhile it's revealed that the morphine is coming from Sheldon who sold the morphine from the ship that he and the rest of his squad came home on. Sheldon wanted to sell the morphine legally in order to provide it to veterans who came back from the war and might need it but Mickey Cohen who is the leader of an organized crime syndicate in Los Angeles starts selling the product on the street. Cole makes his discovery but before he can do anything about it his affair with Elsa goes public Public, thanks to Roy Earl and he's demoted to arson which everyone sees as the lowest department you can be a part of and Cole's wife and kids kick him out of the home and he decides to stay with Elsa meanwhile Sheldon who doesn't want anything to do with the morphine distribution now that innocent people are overdosing on it tells Mickey that he's out he's done he's taking his morphine with him and then he turns to Dr. Fontaine about not knowing what to do with the rest of the morphine Dr. Fontaine promises that he'll distribute it at medical clinics and only give it to those who need it, who need it. And with the money that he gets from it, he would invest in a housing development plan known as the Suburban Redevelopment Fund. But in reality, Fontaine just starts selling it to students from the university he teaches at and other addicts. Cole, now in arson with Herschel Biggs, his new partner, investigate a series of house fires with similarly suspicious circumstances. Cole tries to look further into it, but due to his affair and disgraced history, he isn't given enough resources to do so. So he calls Jack Kelso, another member of his old army squad, to do some private investigating on his own. After being jumped, ran over several times, and kidnapped, Cole, Herschel, and Jack find out that the Suburban Redevelopment Fund is a scam to build homes for veterans with super cheap materials so that the worth of the land goes up. They then burn the homes and cash in on the insurance money while also selling the land for almost three times the profit before the price can go down on it. Jack and Cole find out that the man burning down the homes is Ira Hogboom, who was being manipulated by a Dr. Fontaine. Sheldon finds out that Dr. Fontaine has been doing all this and lying, and when he confronts him, Dr. Fontaine kills Sheldon. Ira kills Dr. Fontaine and then kidnaps Elsa, who also went to go see Dr. Fontaine. Technically trying to keep her safe since the corrupt police force and everyone else is also after her, Cole and Jack find Elsa and Ira in the sewers, and the rush to escape is on after a flood breaks out. Jack kills Ira and he and Elsa escape the sewers, but Cole is taken by the flood before he can escape and is killed. Uh, some time passes by and we cut to Cole's funeral where an angry Elsa storms out after Roy Earl gives his fake little speech, fake ass bitch. Before the game ends, we get one final flashback of Sheldon, Jack, and the rest of the squad on the ship riding home planning the morphine heist. Jack tells them that they shouldn't go through with it, but Sheldon and the rest of the group have made up their minds. And that's basically the story for L.A. Noir. It's not too complicated, but it definitely requires that you pay attention because missing even a small detail can leave you puzzled like, what's going on? And that goes double for the gameplay. Instead of running around shooting guns, I mean, you do shoot guns, but we'll get to that. The main draw in L.A. Noir is an interrogation system. The gameplay loop for L.A. Noir usually goes... 
You get told about the case you're going to be investigating. You drive to the location. With the hold of a button, sometimes you can let your partner drive there, which just skips to the location. Uh, you walk around and investigate a crime scene. You talk to a couple of people. You head to another location where you rinse and repeat. It's a dialogue-heavy game where you need to listen to what they're telling you and look at their faces to determine if they are telling the truth. That was a difficult sentence to get through. Uh, keeping a small bit of information from you or are straight-up lying. And for the most part, this is a fun system. When L.A. Noir came out, the whole gimmick was a revolutionary and very expensive detailed facial structure in the game which let characters in the game really express how they're feeling at the time it was cool as fuck it was trippy being able to tell if a character was lying to you based on how they answered a question and how stressed they look when you investigate a crime scene you might find a piece of evidence or someone might tell you something later on or when you're interrogating another character they might lie to you and you're like wait a second you're lying and this piece of evidence i found proves it and you're awarded with xp and a sense of satisfaction like hell yeah i should totally become a cop and i hope you like what you're seeing because this is about 70 percent of the game right here walking around picking things up and talking to people it definitely helps that the vibe of the game is strong when you're driving around with the radio playing music from the 40s and the old school cars drive by and the people walk around with their 40s outfits it really does pull you in you really feel like you're there which depending on who you are might not be the most convincing positive out there there are also shooting sections you can't just pull out your gun and start shooting all willy-nilly oh no 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 the game has designated moments where you're given a gun and you need to kill some baddies i hate these parts of the game rockstar rockstar baby rockstar honey what happened? The game that came out before this one? Red Dead Redemption. And even before that, GTA 4 and its DLCs. So why is the shooting in this game so gosh dang trash? It's clunky. The guns don't feel good. You never know how much ammo you have until the character announces he's out and drops the gun. When Cole gets shot, he doesn't react to getting shot. The screen just turns black and white slowly until he dies. Uh, the cover system is wonky, and I can never get him to turn a corner while staying in cover, even though the game tells me it's a thing. Every time I'm in cover, I will admit that after a while I did get used to it, and while I wouldn't say I was having fun, I definitely was able to accept the controls as like wonky PS2-like controls, but it's weird having the shooting controls feel this unsatisfying when it's rocks star and this game came out when GTA 4 and Red Dead both had already come out years before. And those games' shooting controls are near perfect, in my opinion. Sure, the argument can be made that the shooting isn't the focus in this one. It's all about the interrogation system. And sure, yeah, but it's Rockstar. There are so many compilations on YouTube showing off just how much work and detail goes into every single inch of their games. And it just catches me off guard that the shooting in this one is as mediocre as it is. But that's not all. There's melee combat, too. And it's just as... Actually, no. It's even worse than the shooting. Fist fights are even rarer than shooting segments, but god when they happen. You got your punch button, you got your dodge button, you got your grapple button. The punching feels slow and super unsatisfying. Dodging is clunky and it's easier to just back up out of the way from the punch. And it feels like enemies take way too many punches before going down. So there's this detective work and there's the combat. But again, it's a Rockstar game, which means it's open world. And how is the open world? I mean, it's alright, like... Okay, let's get the positives out of the way. The aesthetic is spot on, and visually, it looks great. The city is huge and looks exactly like LA. There are tons of collectibles to find. You got landmarks that you collect by driving by, hidden badges, film reels, the previously mentioned newspapers. I played the PS4 remaster, which also adds on novels and gold records, and finally hidden vehicles scattered all over the map. Also, whenever you're driving around in a cop car, you'll get called to complete one of 40 side missions, which is usually some type of small crime. You get XP for collecting any of these collectibles and for completing the side crime missions. You also get XP during interrogations, depending on how good you did, you get more XP. Every time you rank up, you get rewarded with a handful of collectibles being revealed on the map or an intuition point, which you can then use during a crime scene search or during interrogations to show you any remaining or hidden, ev ed 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 any remaining or hidden evidence or just to tell you how to respond to someone's answer to a question. Now, it sounds like there's like a lot of side stuff to do, but there's not. And it's not the game's fault. You can't just pull out your gun and start shooting and even if you drive around causing destruction, you never get a wanted level because why would you? So it all just feels so inconsequential. The game also has voice acting. Most of it is top notch. In fact, almost all of it is near perfect. If you do something stupid now, you don't stand a chance in front of the grand jury. Nice of you to give me up, sweetheart. All that whispering in my ear telling me how we had to get rid of him, how good it could be, all the money we could claim, all that planning. How to get him into the street? How to make it look like an accident? For God's sake, you had Leroy, all shut the up! The banks is covered, baby. I have nothing to do, do with you it. You think I'm gonna fry for you, He's Lorna? He's a crazy man. Shoot him! Shoot him for God's sake! He was a better man than you'll ever know. You say one more word about him, and I will blow your fucking head off. You finally lost it, partner. And then every once in a while, you have. Give it up, Bowers. There's nowhere left to go. I really like how Cole Phelps yells when he falls. Ah! 
Like I said earlier, when you interrogate someone, you have three options. A good cop option, which is where you think the person is telling you the truth or as much of the truth as they can tell you. A bad cop option, which is where you think they're kind of telling the truth, but you feel like you can get more out of them or you think they're lying about something, but it's not something evidence can prove. So you just kind of threaten them or scare them a little bit. And then accuse option, which is where you think they're straight up lying and you got the receipts to back up that talk. The main thing to look at is the person's eyes. The idea is that when they're making direct eye contact with you and speaking in a calm demeanor, you can usually count on them telling the truth. But if you want to choose bad cop or accuse them, then you got to look for shifty eyes and maybe an evil little smile or a nervous lip bite or thoughtful eyes. For, for a majority of the game, this is a reliable way to play the game until it isn't. There are some characters that it feels like they forgot to animate their lying face because they answer my question directly, making absolutely no movements at all uh, face-wise. So I'm like, okay, cool. Let me believe him real quick. And I, I'm wrong. Okay, well, maybe it makes it so he looks a little bit suspicious. A and I know he looks like a ball sack, but even sacks have feelings. At the end of every case, you get this rating determining how much damage you cause on the vehicle or city or people you hit while driving around. It also shows how many clues you found in that case and how many good cop, bad cop, and accused segments you got right. And then it gives you a star rating out of five and a summary of the case depending on how you played this screen right here does not matter even a little bit which takes me to my next problem the story progression la noir has a brutal story especially for a mainstream video game and for the time that it came out it covers some super uncomfortable topics and it doesn't hold back characters in this game are beaten tortured racially discriminated against embarrassed and degraded sexually assaulted and murdered in gruesome fashion i respect this game for going all in on the story it's a good story that takes itself as serious as it presents itself and it pulls it all off with that being said let's say you get every question in a case wrong you don't find enough clues no idea what you're doing and you end up arresting the wrong person which is something i did multiple times well the game doesn't give you a game over screen if you mess up and the wrong man goes to jail then the game keeps going but almost nothing changes the only thing that is different is that you get yelled at at the end of the case you get a summary telling you that you bubbled up one star and the next cutscene is the same person who yelled at you congratulating you because they want to promote you because you're such a good detective huh what the choices and story beats in this game feel disconnected to the end result because it doesn't matter how bad you are at the game it doesn't matter if you're the worst detective ever because the game is just going to rubber band people's responses to you depending on how the game wants you to be seen and even then it feels like there's things missing cole cheating on his wife is a huge part of the game it's like the reason he's demoted it's the reason that things kick off it's the reason he investigates the suburban redevelopment fund and when he gets home, there's a big dramatic scene where he's kicked out of the house and the kids don't want to see him. But we never see his kids. We never see him interact with them or be a dad. And in fact, this scene right here is the first time we ever see Cole's wife. He mentions her in a few car conversations, but then we're supposed to care about this emotional dramatic scene. But it's the first time we're ever seeing Cole's wife. I want to care about this moment, but I just don't. I don't care. L.A. Noir is a really good game, I swear, or at the very least, it's a unique one, an overall well-made game that I recommend to anyone looking for a story-driven adventure who doesn't mind a slower story with interesting characters and decent twists, even if it takes a while to get to that point. There are tons of problems with it for sure, but I honestly was having fun for a majority of my playthrough, and maybe I'll even replay it in like 10 years. Or I could spend $350 for a VR and immediately play it again. Ma'am! <laughs> <laughs>